Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of A Slip of the Keyboard by Terry Pratchett, in his own words. This is a collection of his non-fiction writing on various topics. Uh, it's got a foreword by Neil Gaiman. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb. I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Terry Pratchett earned a place in the hearts of readers the world over with his best-selling Discworld series. But in recent years, he became equally well known as an outspoken campaigner for causes including Alzheimer's research and animal rights. A slip of the keyboard brings together the best of Pratchett's non-fiction writing on his life, on his work, and on the weirdness of the world. From Granny Pratchett to Gandalf's love life, from banana daiquiris to books that inspired him, from getting started as a writer to the injustices that he fought to end. With his trademark humour, humanity, and unforgettable way with words, this collection offers an insight behind the scenes of Discworld into a much-loved and much-missed figure, man and boy, bibliophile and computer geek, champion of hats, orangutans, and the right to a good death. So in the foreword here, Neil Gaiman. So uh, Gaiman writes here, he says, there is a fury to Terry Pratchett's writing. It's the fury that was the engine that powered Discworld, and you will discover it here. It's the anger at the headmaster who would decide that six-year-old Terry Pratchett would never be smart enough for the 11 plus. Anger at pompous critics, and at those who think that serious is the opposite of funny. Anger at his early American publishers who could not bring his books out successfully. The anger is always there, an engine that drives. By the time this book enters its final act and Terry learns he has a rare early onset form of Alzheimer's, the targets of his fury change. Now he is angry with his brain and his genetics and, more than these, furious at a country that will not permit him or others in a similarly intolerable situation to choose the manner and the time of their passing. And that anger, it seems to me, is about Terry's underlying sense of what is fair and what is not. He uh, concludes, he says, Terry Pratchett is not a jolly old elf at all, not even close. He's so much more than that. As Terry walks into the darkness much too soon, I find myself raging too. At the injustice that deprives us of what? Another 20 or 30 books? Another shelf full of ideas and glorious phrases and old friends and new? Of stories in which people do what they really do do best, which is use their heads to get themselves out of the trouble they got into by not thinking? Another book or two like this, of journalism and agitprop and even the occasional introduction? But truly, the loss of these things does not anger me as it should. It saddens me, but I, who have seen some of them being built close up, understand that any Terry Pratchett book is a small miracle, and we already have more than might be reasonable, and it does not behoove any of us to be greedy. I rage at the imminent loss of my friend, and I think, what would Terry do with this anger? Then I pick up my pen and I start to write. So on to uh, Pratchett's writing. So he's writing about his uh, palm top for The Independent here in July 1993. So he says, uh, It always puzzled me why the weight of portable machines wasn't the first thing mentioned in any review. It tends to be in the small print even now, way down the page. This is because reviewers get hypnotised by shiny discs and glittery screens. Let them carry them around for a day, say I. Let them hoik them around so they can get on with their work in studio green rooms and hotels and the backs of cabs. I grew up reading science fiction and there were always these guys carrying pocket computers which could talk and keep track of their diary and run whole planets. They never got hernias carrying the things. I don't see why I should either. I was suffering from the opposite of future shock, whatever that is. Future suction. I don't want arms reaching to my knees, but I like to have a computer around. And then he got a palm top. And I want to read this bit out, because uh, again, this is just really fascinating glimpse back in time. After two years of looking, I ended up with, and indeed I'm typing this on, the Olivetti Quaderno. It cost me almost £600 and must have been one of the first on sale last year. Pioneers are penalised. My agent bought one a few months later and they threw in a free add-on disk drive. And now there's been a sizeable further price cut amid reports of a new souped-up model. What it is, simply, is this. It's the desktop PC I bought in 1987, shrunk to A5 size, one inch thick and weighing a little over two pounds. I've never weighed the little power supply and battery charger. I've never really noticed it weighing anything very much. It certainly fits in my briefcase. I can lose it in my briefcase. But most importantly, it runs all my software accumulated over years of trial and error. It runs memory resident programs like Sidekick and the incomparable Info Select. It runs WordPerfect 4.2, the classic version. I don't have to look at a screen like a letterbox or be forced to use someone else's idea of the right software. It's got a 20 megabyte hard disk, which means you can write a novel on it and have it all there, all in one go. There's half of one on it now. And uh, in a short thing that he wrote for the, well, I can read the whole thing out here actually. This is a contribution for the word, London's Festival of Literature 2000. He said, I like the fortuitous onomatopoeia of words for soundless things, gleam, glint, glitter, glisten. They all sound exactly as the light would sound if it made a noise. Glint is sharp and quick, it glints. And if an oily surface made a noise, it would go glisten. And bliss sounds like a soft meringue melting on a warm plate. But I'll plump for susurration, from the Latin susurus, whisper or rustling, which is exactly what it sounds like. 
It's a hush noise, but it hints of plots and secrets and people turning to one another in surprise. It's the noise, in fact, made just after the sword is withdrawn from the stone and just before the cheering starts. Uh, and this is interesting in How to Be a Professional Boxer from his foreword to the Writers and Artists Yearbook 2006. So he says, um, I took notes. I've never had occasion to use one magnificent tip from a well-known author, but I pass it on anyway. Keep an eye on the trade press. When an, ed when an editor moves on, immediately send your precious manuscript to his or her office with a covering letter addressed to said departed editor. Say, in the tones of one engaged in a cooperative effort, something like this. Dear X, I was very pleased to receive your encouraging letter indicating your interest in my book, and I have made all the changes you asked for. Of course they won't find the letter. Publishers can never find anything but at least someone might panic enough to read the manuscript. And uh, I want to read the end of this out. He says, I get asked all the time in letters and emails and questions from the floor. Can you give me a few tips about being a writer? And you sense that gleam in the eye, that hope that somehow this time you'll drop your guard and hand over the map to the Holy Grail, or preferably, or preferably its URL. I detect now a slightly worrying edge to all this, a hint of indignation that grammar, spelling and punctuation have a part to play. Don't publishers have people to do all that, was one response and that the universe is remiss in not making allowance for the fact that you don't have the time. So instead, I give tips on how to be a professional boxer. A good diet is essential, of course, as is a daily regime of exercise. Pay attention to your footwork, it will often get you out of trouble. Go down to the gym every day, every day of your life that finds you waking up capable of standing. Take every opportunity to watch a good professional fight. In fact, watch as many bouts as you can because you can even learn something from the fighters who get it wrong. Don't listen to what they say, watch what they do. And don't forget the diet and the exercise and the road work. Got it? Well, becoming a writer is basically exactly the same thing, except that it isn't about boxing. It's as simple as that. Freaking love that, mate, that's great. So some of the stuff I quite liked is when he's talking about the uh, various, you know, cons and stuff that he's gone to. So, um, this is a book signing, I think he says. They've tried, they've really tried, but somewhere someone came up with the idea that fantasy equals horror equals coffins and obtained an actual coffin on wheels for use as a signing table. This raises a few problems. One of them, of course, is of good taste, but more practical is the fact that coffins are made for lying in or kneeling by, not sitting at, and since this one is on casters, it gently slides away as I sign until it's at arm's length. In the end, we settle for a dull but practical table, and they save the coffin for Anne Rice, who knows how to do this stuff. And I think this is interesting too, because I would echo this sentiment, uh, as I think would a lot of Discworld fans, but it's interesting that the author himself says this. He says, Nobody ever told me to write. No one ever told me what I was doing wrong. My first novel was published by the first publisher I sent it to, and so I've been learning as I go, and I find it now rather embarrassing that people beginning the Discworld series start with The Colour of Magic and The Light Fantastic, which I don't think are some of the best books to start with. This is the author saying this, folks. Do not start at the beginning with Discworld. Yeah, go and read uh, Guards, Guards or Men at Arms, whichever one of those is first, I can't remember. And I think this is an interesting little bit that kind of shows why the Discworld is different to, say, Middle Earth. He says, I think I've probably done great harm to the world of fantasy. Fortuitously, although I'm not very cerebral about what I write, lots and lots of people are doing theses and doctorates on me. So apparently I'm a postmodern fantasy writer. I think this is because I've got a condom factory in Ankh-Morport. Admittedly, the troll that does all the packing wonders what the women are laughing about when he is packing the big boys. But you cannot imagine a condom machine in Middle Earth. Well, actually I can, regrettably. But you certainly can't imagine one in Narnia, and nor should you. But the curious thing is Ankh-Morport can survive this. Ankh-Morport does survive most things. And I uh, quite like this, this is uh, from his essay on Kevin's. Um, he says, back in the golden days when I was first writing, my wife Lynn used to bring me elevenses, and with the elevenses came a lot of manuscripts and a lot of letters. My wife christened them Kevins. It's quite unfair. It was just that, well, one day the post included three letters, all from boys called Kevin, and she wrote Kevins on the small folder, and somehow the name stuck. And so uh, later on he says, many of them have this in common though. They express doubts that the author will read the letter, let alone answer it. The letter is an act of faith. It's as though they put a message in a bottle and tossed it into the sea, but, well, when I was young, I wrote a letter to J.R.R. R. Tolkien, just as he was becoming extravagantly famous. I think the book that impressed me was Smith of Wotton Major. Mine must have been among hundreds or thousands of letters he received every week. I got a reply. It might have been dictated. For all I know, it might have been typed to a format, but it was signed. He must have had a sack full of letters from every commune and university in the world, written by people whose children are now grown up and trying to make a normal life while being named Galadriel or Moonchild. It wasn't as if I'd said a lot. There were no numbered questions. I just said I'd enjoyed the book very much, and he said thank you. For a moment, it achieved the most basic and treasured of human communications. You are real, and therefore so am I. 
After thinking about that, I've tried to persuade myself that the mail isn't a distraction from writing, but some kind of necessary echo of it. It's part of the whole process, a kind of after-sales service. There is, admittedly, the terminally weird letter, although these are rare, and sometimes the handwriting defeats us. And readers who want to continue a lengthy correspondence sometimes have to be gently let down because of God's lack of foresight in putting only one 24 hours in one day. But apart from these rarities, they all get answered sooner or later, I hope. It's part of the whole thing, if ever I manage to work out what the whole thing is. My parents wanted to call me Galadriel, while my dad did, and my mum was like, no. Because if they did, then the kids at school would have called me Glad, and everyone would have thought my name was Gladys. This is if I was a woman, of course. I am not. So I'm stuck with Dane from Dane of the Iron Hills. And um, here he talks about a kind of fantasy that I hate. <laughs> um, but also some interesting stuff on genres. So he says, genres are also, fantasy perhaps most of all, a big bulging pantry of plots, conceits, races, character types, myths, devices and directions, most of them hallowed by history. You're allowed to borrow, as many will have done before you. If this were not the case, there would only ever have been one book about a time machine. To stay with the cookery metaphor, they're all just ingredients. What matters is how you bake the cake. Every decent author should have their own recipe, and the best find new things to add to the mix. World building is an integral part of a lot of fantasy, and this applies even in a world that is superficially our own, apart from the fact that Nelson's fleet at Trafalgar consisted of hydrogen-filled airships. It is said that during the fantasy boom in the late 80s, publishers would maybe get a box containing two or three runic alphabets, four maps of the major areas covered by the sweep of the narrative, a pronunciation guide to the names of the main characters, and, at the bottom of the box, the manuscript. Please, there is no need to go that far. There is a term that readers have been known to apply to fantasy that is sometimes an unquestioning echo of better work gone before, with a static society, conventionally ugly, bad races, magic that works like electricity and horses that work like cars. It's EFP, or extruded fantasy product. It can be recognised by the fact that you can't tell it apart from all the other EFP. Yeah, I get offered a lot of that for review. I also think it's interesting, he talked earlier on in this book about how his Discworld and stuff, he never planned it out, like he never planned out a street map of Ankh Morpork or whatever. And actually it was to his surprise when people offered to work with him to create things like maps that he discovered, oh wow, it does actually all fit together. I think there was another one with, um, there was a character who had been said to have eight brothers and like coincidentally through about six different books he happened to have named eight bro uh, eight brothers in the narrative without ever having meant to do it. So uh, we've got here uh, a speech given at Novacon 1985 called Why Gandalf Never Married and um, he says here, I better say at the start that I don't actually believe in magic any more than I believe in astrology because I'm a Taurian and we don't go in for all that weirdo occult stuff. And uh, so he used to work in the press office for a uh, nuclear reactor and um, this is an interesting little bit a conversation that he had with his colleagues who bear in mind they're all like STEM people, science, technology, engineering and mathematics or whatever it is. So uh, one of them said, I wonder what legends will accumulate around this place in a thousand years time when it's just a mound. The villagers will probably say that at midnight you can see a team of physicists walk their rounds. And we agreed that if people didn't think very carefully about warning signs, a dead and buried nuclear reactor would make the classic cursed tomb. Not long after breaking into it, people would die mysteriously. That impressed me. I didn't know engineers could think like that. Already the hard edges of the machinery were being filmed with the grease of fantasy. Or whimsy, you might say, which is only fantasy with its shirt undone. I realised then that if ever there is a moon base, or a Mars base, or an L5 colony, then our interior decorator minds will furnish the new landscape with reconditioned fantasies. Shadowy figures that live in the girder work and steal electricity, maybe. Or dwarfs that come out of the computer panelling and clean your helmet at night if you leave them a bowl of nutrient soup. We spray our fantasies on the landscape like a dog sprays urine. It turns it into ours. Once we've invented our gods and demons, we can propitiate or exercise them. Once we put fairies in the sinister solitary thorn tree, we can decide where we stand in relation to it. We can hang ribbons on it, see visions under it, or bulldoze it up and call ourselves free of superstition. So here we have uh, Pratchett talking about uh, elves being bastards, basically. It's called Elves Were Bastards, or if you want to pronounce it properly, Elves Were Bastards? Uh, I get depressed with these fluffy dragons and noble elves. Elves were never noble, they were cruel bastards. And I dislike heroes, you can't trust the buggers. They always let you down. I don't believe in the natural nobility of kings, because a large percentage of them in our history have turned out to be power crazed idiots. And I certainly don't believe in the wisdom of wizards. I've worked with their modern equivalents, and I know what I'm talking about. 
Okay, so I'm going to read this bit out from Let There Be Dragons. This was published on my fourth birthday, 11th of June, 1993. Oh, uh, a speech in defence of fantasy, given when guest of honour at the Booksellers Association Conference annual dinner in Torquay. All right. He says, I've still got the first book I ever read. It was The Wind in the Willows. Well, it was probably not the first book I ever read. That was no doubt called something like Nursery Fun or Janet and John Book One. But it was the first book I opened without chewing the covers or wishing I was somewhere else. It was the first book which, at the age of 10, I read because I was genuinely interested. I know now, of course, that it is totally the wrong kind of book for children. There is only one female character and she's a washerwoman. No attempt is made to explain the social conditioning and lack of proper housing that makes stoats and weasels act the way they do. Mr. Badger's house is an insult to all those children not fortunate enough to live in a wild wood. The mole and the rat's domestic arrangements are probably acceptable, but only if they come right out and talk frankly about them. But it was pressed into my hand, and because it wasn't parents or teachers who were recommending the book, I read it from end to end, all in one go. And then I started again from the beginning, because I had not realised that there were stories like this. There's a feeling that I think is only possible to get when you're a child and discover books. It's a kind of fizz. You want to read everything that's in print before it evaporates before your eyes. I had to draw my own map through this uncharted territory. The message from the management was that yes, books were a good idea, but I don't recall anyone advising me in any way. I was left to my own devices. I'm now becoming perceived as a young people's writer. Teachers and librarians say, you know, your books are really popular among children who don't read. I think this is a compliment. I just wish they would put it another way. In fact, genre authors get to know their reader profile quite intimately. And I know I have a large number of readers who are old enough to drive a car and possibly claim a pension. But the myth persists that all my readers are age 14 and called Kevin. And so I've taken an interest in the dark underworld called children's literature. It, not many people do it seems to me, apart from those brave souls who work with children and are interested in what they read. They're unsung resistance heroes in a war that is just possibly being won by sonic hedgehogs and bionic plumbers. And you can tell that was 1993. He says, I now know that almost all fiction is at some level fantasy. What Agatha Christie wrote was fantasy. What, Tam, what Tom Clancy writes is fantasy. What Jilly Cooper writes is fantasy, at least I hope for her sake it is. But what people generally have in mind when they hear the word fantasy is swords, talking animals, vampires, rockets, science fiction is fantasy with bolts on, and around the edges it can be pretty silly. Yet fantasy also speculates about the future, rewrites the past, and reconsiders the present. It plays games with the universe. Right, so um, here he talks about overpopulation, and I think this is interesting because I was reading uh, Isaac Asimov writing about that recently. Uh, from a similar time period, he said, I first came across words like ecologist and overpopulation in science fiction books in the late 50s and early 60s, long before they had become fashionable. Yes, probably Malthus had said it first, but you don't read Malthus when you're 11, though you might read someone like John Brunner or Harry Harrison because their books have got an exciting spaceship on the cover. And uh, he says, as part of it, you came across a lot of trash, but the human mind has a natural tendency to winnow out the good stuff from the rubbish. It's like gold mining. You have to shift the ton of dirt to get the gold. If you don't shift the dirt, you won't find the nugget. And uh, he also says, please just call it fantasy, by the way. Don't call it magical realism. That's just fantasy wearing a collar and tie. Mark of Cain words. Words used to mean fantasy written by someone I was at university with. Like the fairy tales that were its forebears. Fantasy needs no excuses. And then he does this great, he uh, quotes G.K. Chesterton. This is quite a famous quote. He says, one of, the one of the great popular novelists of the early part of this century was G.K. Chesterton. Writing at a time when fairy stories were under attack for pretty much the same reason as books can now be covertly banned in some schools because they have the word witch in the title. He said, the objection to fairy stories is that they tell children there are dragons. But children have always known there are dragons. Fairy stories tell children that dragons can be killed. Mm. And I call back to my dad wanting to call me Galadriel. Here he says, uh, he went on reading and since if you read enough books you overflow, I eventually became a writer. One day I was doing a signing in a London bookshop and next in the queue was a lady in what back in the 80s was called a power suit despite its laughable lack of titanium armour and proton guns. She handed over a book for signature. I asked her what her name was. She mumbled something. I asked again. After all, it was a noisy bookshop. There was another mumble which I could not quite decipher. As I opened my mouth for the third attempt, she said, It's Galadriel, okay? I said, Were you by any chance born in a cannabis plantation in Wales? She smiled grimly. It was a camper van in Cornwall, she said, but you've got the right idea. It wasn't Tolkien's fault, but let us remember in fellowship and sympathy all the Bilbos out there. And the Dane of the Iron Hills is. He says, Blue Jupiter, viewing the giant planet in the daylight, is something I discovered myself one evening in early autumn, when I spotted Sirius just visible in the sky and realised that the highly sophisticated go-to function on my shiny new telescope would be able to use this data to locate Jupiter right at that moment. 
and five minutes later there it was, blue and white like the daytime moon and with three of its own satellites visible. They kept the universe turned on even during the daytime. I'd always known that to be true, but it was a moment of epiphany. By whom, from what, and why, I don't know. But any epiphany is worth having. This is marvellous as well. A uh, bit, of, bit of insight into how the publishing industry works, he says. My agency did some calculations and presented the publisher with figures to show how much their sloth was costing them, because his US publishers were shit, basically. Things began to move. Not long afterwards, my publisher either took over somebody else or got taken over themselves. In practice, it's always a little difficult to be certain in these matters, because publishers tend to collide like galaxies, and you're never quite sure who ran into who, only that some stars have exploded and some constellations have gone freelance. Oh, and then he talks about roundhead wood in Forty Green, and he says, Forty Green is near High Wycombe in the Chilterns. I lived there when I was at primary school and it was there that I learned how to spit, how to live with scabby knees and how to run away. And uh, yeah, he likes, he likes uh, round head wood. So Susie and I are gonna have to go and find it. I know so, where it is. Yeah, it's not far away, a couple of miles. Oh, and then he's got a piece here, the introduction to the king and I, or how the bottom has dropped out of the wise man business. Written for the Western Daily Press, 24th of December, 1970. He says, working at this paper was my second job. I had just started there after leaving the books free press when I wrote this piece. It was at the Books Free Press, my first job out of school, that I knew three all re that I knew three real wise men. Mr. Church was a solemn one. He took his position seriously and he made his newcomers take it seriously as well. I'm not gonna read you all this. This is just about some people who worked at the Books, White, Books Free Press. But that's our local newspaper. So here we have a, an introduction to the Leaky Establishment by David Langford, who I think David Langford also did some of the Discworld quiz books, I think. Uh, he says, this says it all really, we both worked in places where science, engineering and bureaucracy crashed into one another. As a press officer, a man responsible for getting information out in a hurry, sometimes at any rate, I was forbidden to touch a typewriter. Strictly speaking, I was supposed to write out releases in longhand and send them to the typing pool from whence they might be returned to me tomorrow. However, by this time, the average nuclear reactor can be quite well alight, so I just typed stuff anyway and no one said anything. It was, in retrospect, a great life for a science fiction fan. After Chernobyl, it seemed there was no question too weird for the local nodding acquaintances of the Earth to plant with willing reporters. Will your nuclear power stations withstand an ice age? No. Why not? Answer. Because a two-mile-high glacier scouring the content down to bedrock puts a crimson everyone's day. Isn't it scandalous that there's a fault line running through the power station car park? Answer. Not really. It's about 200 feet long and hasn't moved for 60 million years. He says, uh, one of my many strange jobs was escorting TV and movie researchers when they were scouting power station locations for upcoming dramas. I'd take them up to the pile cap, the top of the reactor, and they'd look around in dismay at the total absence of green steam. They never believed me when I told them that green steam is not a normal reactor product. Then they'd bring their own for the shoot. Oh, and big fake panels covered in flashing lights too, because we didn't have enough. In fact, our power stations were a complete disappointment. They were so unlike the real things. So here Pratchett's talking about Christmas. He says, uh, the Christmas holiday still has a lot going for it. When you're self-employed like me, for example, it's often hard to stop working. When your office is next to your living space, it's so easy to wander over and start writing. Saturdays and Sundays become the easiest days of all to work because the phone doesn't ring as much. One of the reasons I like Christmas is because it's perfectly socially acceptable not to work for a week. It's a time to take stock. I actually usually just work all Christmas, but you know. I thought this was interesting. He says, that reminds me why I gave up Dungeons and Dragons. There were too many monsters. Back in the old days, you could go around a dungeon without meeting much more than a few orcs and lizard men. But then everyone started inventing monsters and pretty soon it was a case of bugger the magic sword. What you really needed to be the complete adventurer was the Marcus L. Rowland 15 volume guide to monsters and the ability to read very, very fast. Because if you couldn't recognize them from the outside, you pretty soon got the chance to try looking at them from the wrong side of their tonsils. So this is the start of an introduction called the God Moment. And this is interesting because he talks about Penn, which is another nearby location. Uh, so this was written in the mail on Sunday. I like the small gods, like Anoya, and I think the universe has meaning. It has a purpose. It might not be our purpose, but we're part of it. The vicar when I lived in Penn was a Reverend Musprat. He was quite posh for a clergyman. I think old ladies gave him a lot of money and a lot of tea. He came in one day through the scullery. We had sculleries in those days. I like them. My father had brought back from Burma a bust of the Buddha, and my mother really liked it. Reverend Musprat pointed at it and said, that is a pagan icon. Even I, at that time, knew enough to know that anyone talking to my mum like that was in trouble. She threw him out on the step. And here he says, uh, There is a rumour going around that I have found God. I think this is unlikely, because I have enough difficulty finding my keys, and there is empirical evidence that they exist. Here is a good example of some of the anger that Neil Gaiman said, you know, it was in Pratchett's writing. 
Twice, when I have spoken out on subjects like Alzheimer's and assisted dying, helpful Christians have told me that I should try considering my affliction as a gift from God. Now, personally, I would have preferred a box of chocolates. Nevertheless, there may be some truth, a curiously convoluted truth in that, because it has made me look at the world, just like my pants, from a new perspective, which according to G.K. Chesterton is the role of fantasy anyway. And now I am living in a kind of fantasy, and I have found that growing within me is a steeliness that I never knew was there. A view of the world that might make Bob Dylan look like a man who was only slightly annoyed about the government. Whereas not so long ago, I used to drift gently through the world, occasionally rebounding softly from the side. I began to open my eyes, which led to a terrible tendency to question authority. Because authority that cannot be questioned is tyranny, and I will not accept any tyranny, even that of heaven. And this is the kind of thing that used to happen to me at school. I remember I, I got in trouble because I wouldn't, like, I'd refuse to pronounce the alphabet A, B, K, D, F, G, because I'd already been taught that it was A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And it seems weird to me in hindsight that they were like, I was like held back and punished for that. For learning it properly before the school taught us the wrong version of it. Very weird. Anyway, uh, he says here, he's talking about his mum. However, she made the mistake of educating me above my age. I recall because it is in fact tattooed on my psyche the day in the third or fourth form when the teacher asked us where the rain came from. It so happened that my mum had told me about the water cycle and how the seas evaporate gently into the sky and form clouds, which are then blown over the land, get cooled down and fall as rain. Of course, all the smart kids, the one with the pegs not marked by soft fruit, had their hands up and were making me, me miss, me miss noises, but the teacher's eye lit upon the silly kid, who was the one raising his hand higher than any other child, and upon a surprised nod, I triumphantly shouted out, the sea miss, the result. The jeering of the class, egged on by the teacher, who hadn't even bothered to ask me why I said so. Even as a bewildered kid, I was thinking in some sort of terrified puzzlement. Well, surely she can't believe that I don't know that it falls out of the sky, but she asked where it came from and I told her the truth. There is a circle of hell for teachers like that, and it's right next to the one set aside for teachers who don't like parents to teach their children to read before they go to school, and one furnace away from people who believe that children should only be given books that are suitable for them. And I tell you what, it isn't big enough or indeed low enough. I didn't tell my mother, of course, because you never told your mother, just in case it got you into more trouble. But something began to seethe and grow, I'm sure of it. But still, I pressed on. Here he talks about a bookshop in Penn, and I've been to this place. It's actually sadly closed down. Um, he says, another breakthrough came when I discovered second-hand bookshops around about the age of 12. Here were the books that no longer turned up on the library shelves, my local library in Beaconsfield being a spanking new library with spanking new books. But my dad told me there was a second-hand bookshop in the village of Penn, a short cycle ride away. Although a difficult cycle ride when you're coming back with two full creaking carrier bags of books hanging off the handlebars. It was a wonderful bookshop. It was where I learned humour. Yeah, unfortunately, after about 60 odd years of history, it, it um, shut down a couple of years ago. The Cottage Bookshop, it was called. Uh, I like this as well. So he's talking about uh, Frogmore, which is part of High Wycombe. It's like part of the town centre, really. Uh, I would say it's a third of a mile from here. <laughs> and so once again, I settled down to being halfway down the class, doing enough schoolwork to survive and no more. My true education was still coming via the library and amazingly from the science fiction books I was consuming like sweets. Bliss it was in that space age dawn to be alive. But unfortunately, my only reliable source of first class second hand American science fiction magazines was called The Little Library. And it was in a shack in Frogmore, a tiny part of High Wycombe, in which a very nice elderly lady dispensed cheer, the occasional cup of tea and pornography. However, in order to justify the name, and presumably to have some wares that she could put up in the window, she also sold decent science fiction and fantasy from second-hand cardboard boxes. Below, how shall I put it, the pinker shelves, which were not at that time of a particular attraction to me. How could you turn your eyes upwards when there was a Brian Aldiss that you hadn't read yet, and something by Harry Harrison, and the third book in James Blish's Cities and Flight trilogy? He says, I consumed and became such an habitué that I was guaranteed a cup of tea twice every week, after which I could leave with my satchel bulging, possibly to the bewilderment of any regular bystander who might have been unaware of the SF booty I called my own. I recall scrabbling around happily one day after school and the door was abruptly pushed open and in came a man who, by the look of his efforts not to look like one, was clearly, even to me, a plainclothes policeman. He pointed angrily at me and demanded of my hostess, who was a dear old soul, what is he doing in here? Gleefully, she brandished a mint copy of Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land, which I certainly was, and said, Honey Swarky Marley Ponce, Geoffrey, which astonishingly he didn't understand, but seemingly accepted. And for those of you with little Latin, it broadly translates as, He who sees any evil in this is a Ponce. 
game set and match to her, I fancy. And she was a decent soul, a nice friend to this kid that she considered was her only legitimate customer. She never encouraged me to become a patron of the Pinker Shells, and nor did she offer me any of the slim envelopes which, when she thought I wasn't looking, she handed to the serious and somewhat furtive connoisseurs of the dirty raincoat persuasion, who were always embarrassed by my presence. I think at the time I thought they probably contained mint condition and therefore expensive science fiction. The penny dropped about a year later when so did other things. And here he's talking about, uh, this is part of Days of Rage. And uh, he's talking about the plight of the orangutans which he ended up funding because he got a lot of like donations through um, because of the librarian basically. So he says, um, this is hardly ideal, but it may help impress on local people that the orangutans themselves are a resource. It is the ecotourism argument. How much would you pay to see orangutans in the wild? Especially if you knew the money was helping to preserve their forest. Currently it's about 12p, the cost of a day ticket into the park, and they throw in the birds and trees for free. There's a bit of scope there, I think. Unfortunately, what looms is something worse than logging. There has always been logging, legal and illegal. Loggers come and go, the forest can heal in time. It's plantations that are now the big and growing problem. Vast tracts of former forests are taken over for agribusiness with the help of foreign investment. They grow palms for palm oil and a species of acacia to feed new wood pulp mills. This is a profitable business, but it means that the forest can't return. There is nothing for the apes in these barren tree factories. We benefit even if we don't realize it. The pulp makes paper, the trees make everything from chipboard to your nice hardwood doors. We can try to shop conscientiously, but that is getting harder to do. We live in a global economy now and increasingly the apes don't. They're being pushed to the edges and they're running out of edges. I can't crack a joke about that. We make a big fuss over the possibility of microbes on Mars. If orangutans were Martians, we'd cherish them. We'd be so amazed at how they're like us but not like us. They'd be invited to tea and cigars at the White House. And then he's raging uh, against the medical industry. There's a drug called Aricept which can slow the progress of Alzheimer's and it costs just £2.50 a day. The bad news is there are 400,000 Alzheimer's sufferers in the UK, so it's been ruled out for NHS use in the mild stages of the disease everywhere except Scotland. He says that the doctors say like, oh, it's just not worth it. And for him, he says it's the difference between a, a, a nice day and a cloudy day, you know? And for £2.50 a day, he'll pay it, but not everybody can. So he says here, um, I can still work at home and control my environment, and my rare variant of the disease is not yet a real burden. The novels turn up as they always have, only the typing is hard. There will now be a moment when the letter A, say, vanishes. It's as if the keyboard closes up and the letter A is not there anymore. Then I'll blink a few times and concentrate and it comes back. I've handed in my driving license. If my brain won't let me see that A, it might not let me see the child on the pedestrian crossing. Unlikely at this stage, but who would risk it? I know I'm luckier than many others, older and younger, who find paying £1,000 a year a big problem. And I can afford a voice recognition program for the computer. There's no way I'm going to retire. I'll be writing until I die. It's my passion. I have other people who can drive me. In the circumstances, I am lucky so far. I didn't think so last November when I was told that I had PCA, a rare form of Alzheimer's which affects the back of the brain. I was offered no form of treatment when I was first diagnosed. One local specialist wasn't familiar with PCA so couldn't take me on, and I wasn't old enough to go to the other local man who would only deal with patients over 65. It wasn't their fault, but when I heard this I felt totally exposed and alone. Hell, I thought, it must be easier to score dope off Fat Charlie behind the bus station than get my hands on Aricept. I made him up as far as I know. Uh, actually, I've been considering using the dark web to get uh, the beta blockers that I was prescribed for my anxiety for a little while and really helped, and then another doctor unprescribed me from them. But I'm not going to buy them off the dark web. And here we have, um, it's a strange life when you come out. People get embarrassed, lower their voices, get lost for words. Part of the report I'm helping to launch today reveals that 50% of Britons think there's a stigma surrounding dementia. Only 25% think there is still a stigma associated with cancer. The stories in the report of people being told they were too young or intelligent to have dementia, of neighbours crossing the street and friends abandoning them, are like something from a horror novel. It seems that when you have cancer, you are a brave battler against the disease, but when you have Alzheimer's, you're an old fart. That's how people see you. It makes you feel quite alone. And then we have the Richard Dimbleby lecture, Shaking Hands with Death, which has also been published as a uh, standalone, so I previously read, and I think reviewed that as well. And then this final note here, um, where he's talking about assist assisted suicide, and he says, but here's the interesting bit. 40% of those who have the prescription to hand die without using it. They've known that they can, and every day they've decided not to. They know that if they choose, it is they who are in control, not the disease. That is power. That is triumph. That is how a human being should die. And I very much agree with Pratchett's views on assisted suicide. So yeah, 
Overall, Terry Pratchett, slip of the keyboard in his own words, very moving, funny at times, sad at times, uh, fascinating for people who are Pratchett fans. I would give it a pretty strong 4.5 out of 5. I thought it was very readable, in contrast to, say, something like the Discworld Companion, which I'm currently reading as my bedtime book, which is more of just like a reference book. This is uh, definitely just, you can read it as a normal book, you know. So yeah, would recommend. So there we have it, that's what I made of a slip of the keyboard by Terry Pratchett. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.